All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the last session for the day. Uh, thanks for joining us. Just a few very quick reminders. You are on mute. Um, if you are using the event app, awesome. Please check into sessions. Please fill out the session survey. If you're having trouble, please email us at eventsatfirst.org so we can help you out. Uh, the session is TLP white and is being recorded. The recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app or the desktop mobile site. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce you to your session moderator, Serge Droz. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, as you said, my name is Serge Droz. I'm session moderator. Just one little thing, a request to all the attendees. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and I'll make sure that we find some time at the end to actually answer these. Uh, having said that, I'd like to introduce uh, Holly Stewart, Anna Bertiger, and Gerada Asharia, I hope I said that correctly, to talk about uh, doing more with less, detecting malicious activities through responsible and privacy preserving AI. And I think after Ron's keynote, I think the privacy preserving talk should kind of generate a mental applause already now. So without further ado, I give the word to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Serge. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us at the last talk of the day. Um, Sharda, Anna, and I are from the Microsoft Defender Security Research Team. Uh, on our team, we build protection capabilities for our email endpoint and cross-service security products. And in particular, Sharda and Anna and I, we focus on using AI as our sort of superpower in the fight against cybercrime. And so our teams have spent a lot of time thinking about the both the privacy of the people that we're trying to protect and also helping to keep them safe. And I think as a lot of folks know these days, AI is, has just become a, a critical tool in this fight, and just to give you sort of a, a day in the life for us, um, it's pretty typical for on a, any average day to see millions of threats across the world um, hitting millions of people uh, that are just that are first seen attacks that we've never seen before. And what's worse is that these are often over within the hour. So there's no time for response. It would take a security researcher over a million hours to go research these threats and figure out what they are. So to keep people safe today, we have to rely on protection that blocks attacks the first time we see it. This is the promise of AI and data science and it's that predictive power that we are effectively using today to block this malicious activity at first sight. So AI at this scale, it requires data, lots and lots and lots of data. And any AI practitioner is going to tell you that the more data you feed the system, the better it's going to perform, especially when it comes to approaches like deep learning. And so as defenders, we are striving to collect the best information, the best data to train our AI systems to help these folks that we're trying to protect. But as does this have to come at the cost of privacy? So what do you do when these two things are at odds? Do you sacrifice the data collection and the privacy, knowing that detection and protection is going to suffer? Or do you fight for the data that you know you need, but risk a backlash on privacy and trust? Uh, that's not really an option for us. <laughs> you, you may have heard this saying, Microsoft runs on trust. Um, and we have to be trusted by the billions of people that we serve and the organizations that are relying on us to protect them. We've made these public commitments to privacy many years ago, and we are evolving these principles further, and we've created a framework for responsible AI. And although all of these principles that you see here are important, we're going to focus on two of them today, uh, reliability and safety, so providing reliable protection, and how this does not have to be at odds with privacy and security. So in the session, we're going to talk about several approaches and we that can deliver on both of these principles. So I want to talk a little bit about our journey and talk about the approaches at a high level. Um, so we'll start with what we call personal data obfuscation. So as a data scientist, 
Uh, what you tend to do when you are first constructing a model is data exploration. And so if I were going to classify. Hey, Holly, hey, Holly real quick. This is Tracy from the first team. Are you sharing slides by chance? Yeah. Uh, I think they're not showing up for all of us here. Oh, okay. Go ahead and click share screen. Let's see. Well, the talk track makes sense. <laughs> the talk is great. They <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Just some technical difficulties. Sorry, I couldn't see the chat. Ah, uh, there you go. All right. Okay. All right, well, you're, you're back. Part. It's got the cute <laughs> child. <laughs> All right. It's my child, actually. OK, so this first example of privacy preserving AI is what we call data obfuscation. I, I think what I was describing is sort of the, the practice that a data scientist typically goes through when they are creating a model. So they do data exploration. They look at the data to try to understand what it means, they may come up with a labeling strategy if you're doing supervised learning to teach the learner how to predict whatever it is that you're trying to predict. And so in this case, I might say, hey, this is a, a child in a fuzzy suit and that's what I'm trying to predict. Everything else is not a child in a fuzzy suit. If I wanted to do personal data obfuscation, I would just remove the face of said child. And that way the personal data, which child it is, I don't need to know that because I'm just trying to identify a small person in a fuzzy suit um, it, without the personal data showing to me or to the model that's trying to learn it. So what if we don't have to look at the data at all? Um, in certain circumstances, we can do what's called eyes off training. So the human or the researcher doesn't lay eyes on the data that may be sensitive, uh, but the model does. And so the model is learning that data and it is able to sufficiently learn on that data and predict the right things in the future. What if we could take that one step further where the model doesn't even see the data and it's encrypted? Um, this is much harder. And in fact, I talked about this as a journey because personal data obfuscation pretty simple approach, uh, not, uh, not perfect, but a pretty good first step in the journey. Eyes off training, a little more difficult. Homomorphic encryption, much more challenging uh, as Anna, uh, Anna will tell you in a little bit. So first of all, I wanna give you a specific security example for personal data obfuscation. Again, using the, the cute child without a face. Uh, and just to make sure we're on the same page about personal data. So personal data is any information that identifies a, a living individual or a human person. So an example of personal data obfuscation using a security example is this malware called Dexbot. It likes to hide files in the favorites folder. Um, and so, Knowing that information and looking at the files that go into the favorites folder can help a researcher or a model predict that these files are related to this malware. But it's not important that you know that it's my favorites folder. So if you obfuscate this piece of information, the important security context is still there for both the researcher and the model to be able to interpret that information and say, yeah, this is Dexbot. And now I will hand it off to Sharna for eyes off training. Uh, thank you, Holly. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about eyes off training, uh, which refers to uh, training ML models without looking at the data. Uh, so now we are looking, we were looking at this cute child. Oops, I advanced. Uh, now we are not only hiding the face of the child, but we are also hiding other details of the child, such as costume. And we are only looking at the shape of the data. So here, uh, conceptually, it refers to not looking at the data, but only looking at maybe volume or some other metrics uh, of the data. Uh, so let's dive into the details. Oops, uh, uh, in off so starting from the top of the box, in Office 365, we have lots of different applications. These applications generate a lot of user telemetry data, as well as they contain uh, customer artifacts, such as documents and emails. So uh, as the second box shows, uh, we use this data to build um, a lot of uh, machine learning models, as well as uh, metrics and dashboard, which are important to maintain the health of the system. 
Uh, and then uh, going towards the third box, uh, the way we use these machine learning models is to build the intelligent solutions that we need at Office 365 ATP. Uh, it stands for Advanced Threat Protection. Uh, today, we are going to talk about um, anti-phishing anti scenarios specifically. So uh, let's look at uh, what the, oops, the slides are advancing a bit faster. Uh, let's look at the uh, uh, life cycle of a typical uh, ML model classifier. So here we are working to uh, uh, working on an anti-phishing email classifier. So the data scientist starts with a sample, a uh, sample of known phishing and uh, uh, non-phishing and uh, phishing emails. Uh, then the data scientist looks at the sample to decide some features that will help us identify or differentiate between phishing versus non-phishing examples. Using these features, we build a, a machine learning models, which is nothing but an algorithm which decides how important a particular feature is in making the decision of uh, an email being phishing or not. Uh, and then once uh, this algorithm is tuned with the right parameters, uh, we go ahead and ship that. Uh, now, monitoring is also a big part of this uh, process. Uh, in monitoring, uh, it uh, we uh, look at the um, spikes in the model behavior as well as customer escalations, which is, as we all know who work in the security, uh, wherever there is an adversary involved, monitoring becomes an important part of the uh, journey. Uh, so now let's look at the same process of building the ML classifier, but in an ISOF environment. Uh, the customer is starting with, uh, uh, sorry, uh, at Microsoft, we are starting with the customer submitted emails, which refers to uh, the emails that customers submit to Microsoft uh, and give us the consent to look at those emails. So here I am talking about the first uh, column on the left. Uh, we employ human graders who uh, grade these uh, emails, and then uh, we, bre uh, we create a corpus that I showed in the previous example. So till this point, so the first two columns, uh, the process is same as what I showed in the last slide. When it comes to eyes on and eyes off environments, uh, here, uh, let's recall that in an eyes off environment, the data scientist can actually look at the data. They can look at the email, how it looks like, what is the image in it, what is the content, how does it look when it's rendered. Uh, after, uh, so, uh, so then the data scientist is using this data set and building a model uh, using the similar process that we saw on the last slide. Uh, after this model is built and ready on graded, uh, graded emails, uh, we uh, move towards eyes of platform. In eyes of platform, uh, the data centers is executing the exactly same code, but uh, they cannot look at the data. So uh, they are only able to look at the final accuracy metrics such as precision and recall. Uh, and we need to train the model again on eyes of data because graded emails don't represent uh, all the samples uh, that we see in entire Office 365 traffic. So that's why we need to retrain the model in with uh, more representative data, which definitely works better in the real uh, production scenario. Uh, now let's look at some challenges with eyes of system. As, as we all know, troubleshooting any production system, uh, especially in the security domain, needs the SME to be able to reproduce and debug the scenario. Uh, like we, uh, we need to look at the positive and neg negative samples during training to identify if there are any unintended patterns that were picked up by the model. Uh, also, inspecting of false negative ex examples. Many times you get uh, escalations from customers saying, oh, this was a big phishing attack, which was not caught by your model or your system. What went wrong here? Doing this in an eyes of system where we cannot look at the data is a big challenge. And we, we have started on a journey to solve that in creative ways. So I want to show you that uh, with an example here. Uh, here uh, we have an uh, email, phishing email, uh, and I'm showing the HTML version of the text. And then the, the one on the right side is the final rendered text. So you can see here the attacker played a trick on her tokenizer where the rendered text doesn't have any spaces and looks like a normal text to human eye. But what our tokenizer parses is the HTML text. And you can see because of the spaces added in between characters, it completely broke the tokenizer. 
And this is where we saw our model performance dropping suddenly because the attack was bigger and we were able to catch that in the spikes uh, that we saw. So how do we uh, deal with, how do we debug these scenarios? That's what we are working on. And one of the important techniques that we use is using similarity-based techniques uh, to identify uh, whether uh, this, this sample is similar to a cluster of emails that we have seen in the graded uh, or customer submitted emails. And then we go from there to identify uh, what is it that may have uh, gone wrong with this particular email. Uh, so, um, uh, with that, I will let um, Anna uh, talk about homomorphic en encryption. Hi, well, I'm excited to talk to you about homomorphic encryption. Uh, homomorphic encryption uh, is the idea, all right, instead of just thinking about uh, how do we obfuscate the cute child, let's just encrypt the whole picture of the cute child. Um, and so, if we're thinking in the security domain, um, phishing URLs, so say you click on that phish email that uh, Sharda had a miss on, we'd still like to protect you. Um, and if you go to a phish website, visual information can be really key signal for anti-phishing ML models. Does this look like it's ask a Microsoft website asking for Microsoft creds, but it's not really a Microsoft website? And so that would entail capturing a screenshot of the user's browser and sending it to the cloud for further computation. Um, and we can't just say, oh, it's this URL, because it might not render the same for me as it does for users. Uh, so this, of course, has some privacy concerns that it might raise. And it might feel like we're in this classic security versus privacy tension situation. So we started doing some research about how we might get around that classic feeling tension and provide some built-in privacy protection. So let's think for a second about some options we might have. One is just don't use this kind of information, like screenshots of pages that might make users nervous, and do the best we can about it. Another is don't send that information to the cloud and do all the computation on the machine. This has some downside, like updating the model here would be really difficult, uh, potentially. Um, we found that the cloud protection is important. Uh, a third would be to encrypt those images or websites. Don't give Microsoft the keys and still somehow expect a computation uh, of, of this model and a result to be returned anyway. Uh, which, if you're familiar with classical encryption, that third one sounds like a completely insane option. Because if I take this screenshot, I encrypt it, I compute the model func I guess I just try and compute on this nonsense ciphertext, I return the results to the client, they decrypt total nonsense results. This is, this is a terrible plan with classical encryption. And so the rescue is a special kind of encryption called homomorphic encryption. And it is special because the sum of two ciphertexts encrypted with the same key is the ciphertext of their sum. And the product of two ciphertexts encrypted with the same key is the ciphertext of their product. This allows us to apply some machine learning algorithms that are really carefully chosen to encrypt data without being able to decrypt. This is free. We do pay a pretty big cost in space and compute time relative to computing in the clear. So, in this scenario, what we settled on uh, is, there we go. Um, there we is that we would, I'm so sorry. The slides are not properly. Okay, here we go. Uh, the, the scenario that we settled on Sound better now. Um, the scenario that we that we settled on here is that we would take the screenshot on the client, uh, extract some features using some standard visual uh, in, uh, visual analysis tools, encrypt those features, send them to the cloud for for encrypted computation on a model in the cloud that was more computationally efficient. Uh, send those encrypted results back to the client where we could decrypt and say, hey, maybe don't go to this website. It's a bad website to go to. 
Um, so we have talked about three ways that we can deal with uh, privacy preserving ML with personal data obfuscation, with ISOF training, and with homomorphic encryption. And this isn't an either or which one's better, what's the right thing to do. This is a yes and all of the above and more. There are many more uh, technical solutions to privacy that we haven't talked about here. And they all have their uses for the right scenarios. And we, we've sort of got to bring all of them together. They all have pluses and minuses. For example, I didn't tell you how to train a model using homomorphic encryption. That's a very hard problem. So thanks very much. And questions, please. Okay, thank you very much. This was uh, especially the part, the last part was kind of mind boggling, but I really like it. So there's a couple of questions actually. Kai Mustikameki asks, would I of models model create creation provide the possibility for the adversary to hide the payload among, e, for example, GDPR protected data, GDPR protected data, uh, GDPR protected data possibly cannot be used in all of the training models? Uh, so, yeah, uh, G, uh, well, GDPR protect, uh, Microsoft does comply to the GDPR standard, uh, but GDPR protected data uh, can be used in the training the machine learning models. It's just that the way the data is used is different. Uh, we have to de-link the information, like if it is an email address of the user, you have to encrypt the email address such that it cannot be tracked back to what was the original email. So uh, as, long as, as long as we take those measures, we, uh, we can use uh, GDPR protected data to train the models. And I'll add on to Sharda what you said. Um, we've also done a lot of research in adversarial ML. We're not talking about that today, but there are a lot of techniques that we embed into the way that the models train to look for anomalies like that and look for potential examples of people trying to do data poisoning. And, and so those algorithms as well help clean the data to make sure that the data that is training the model is also trustworthy. And we can okay. put uh, references to those talks if you're interested. Thanks. Then Sylvain Martinez asks, does your homomorphic encryption solution only work for comparing exact sets of data or can, can it work with similar sets of data? I'm not sure I understand that question. Can you... Uh... Sylvain, could you elaborate? Okay, the question I just asked is basically to try understanding if there is our limitations on using homomorphic encryption. There are definitely tons of limitations in using homomorphic encryption. It's super um, time and space expensive. Um, and you'll notice that it, in the example I gave, we did a bunch of feature extraction on the client pre-encryption. And that's because we couldn't afford to do all of that deep learning based feature extraction encrypted in the cloud. Um, and so we did that on the client instead pre-encryption. Um, and so we, we, there is a huge trade-off here. We did have to be really careful. Um, and, and, and that's sort of why it's organized the way it is. And if you want more details of the exact details of how we did it in this example, uh, one of the links there is to a paper that explain that focuses solely on that. So you can go read 15 pages of technical details. Um, and the other question about what homomorphic encryption algorithm are we looking into? The answer is it, this is based on the simple encrypted arithmetic library maintained at Microsoft Research, uh, which is open source. You can go have a look at it too. Okay, so um, do you now just ask one of the questions in the QA because I lost track. And yes, I did. I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Well, with the last one, I I, uh, I just answered it. I'm sorry. Okay, that, that's what I thought. It's a uh, no, and then uh, 
I guess another fairly technical thing is about how does the algebraic structure necessary for the homomorphic encryption impact a feature selection? What ML algorithms are compatible with homomorphic encryptions? So, um, so there's two ways you could think of ML algorithms. Um, you could think of the both the scoring part and the training part. Um, in this case, we didn't do encrypted training. We only did encrypted scoring. So we've somehow gotten this ML algorithm by hook or by crook some other way. Um, and then for your particular website, we're saying, is this fish or not in an encrypted fashion? Um, and in this case, we, we made it so that the encrypted operations we needed to do were only uh, multiplication and addition. Uh, and that was partly where we're sort of balancing how much can we do encrypted with the speed questions and, and that's where we landed. Okay, there's no more questions in the, in the chat, but I actually have, have a question. Um, so have you applied this to other use cases but then phishing pages, for example, like one thing that comes to mind is kind of a recognizing spammers. Uh, another thing is recognizing actually content on, on cloud storage that's somehow not okay. Homomorphic encryption particularly? No, just any of, of the, the data preserving, I mean, for the privacy preserving algorithms, even like the, the personal data obfuscation, the eyes off stuff, all of them. Yeah, yeah, I can I can take that one. So personal data obfuscation is used throughout uh, pretty much many of the different services that we have in security. Uh, eyes off training is more specific to email mostly. Um, I don't know, Sharda, if you know of other um, applications. Uh, yeah, sure. I can talk about that. So um, uh, the eyes of training platform right now is uh, specific to Office 365 and uh, we do use it for spam detection. So uh, all kinds of uh, security scenarios, identifying compromise accounts, identifying spam emails, uh, not so much about the cloud app uh, protection yet. Uh, that's uh, kind of uh, separate, but um, yes, spam, phishing emails, anything that requires us to process emails is uh, done in eyes of platform okay thanks a lot and uh if there's a, not any more questions um thanks again to you i thought this is a a really exciting a really exciting topic i'm actually glad we're moving to that that so and i like that talk very much hey thanks a lot and uh hopefully we, we meet each other in person at some stage and can take this conversation on over a drink or piece of cake or whatever. Sounds great. Thanks for having us. Yes, Thank we, you. in the app, there's actually a, a link to a, a gather.town social event that we are trying online. So everyone is welcome. We're going to try it. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.